Because it's not that long. It's, very, it's kind of short. This week and then next week, so I'm telling you also, uh, the book of Amos, the verse that we're looking at for next week, or to memorize for next week, it's short, so you got a chance here. Okay? you got a chance. But Joel 2.13 was the memory verse for this week. Levi, time to draw, buddy. Ready for this? All right, here we go. Draw it in. Give me the key. Here we got your mama. <laughs> Drew out your mama. All right, let's hear it, Penny. Gotcha. Read your heart and not your garments. Um, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful. <coughs> Slow to anger and by great kindness. And he relents from doing harm. Add a girl. Very good. There you go. Very good. Very good. Very good. All right. Take your Bibles. Turn with me to the book of Amos. That was short, Miss Fane. That was short. That's right. That was a good one. <laughs> Tonight we are in the book of Amos, okay, the book of Amos, and we are looking at a very interesting prophecy, but more than that, an interesting prophet, as we are now up to week 30. We are past, uh, you know, half a year we've been in this study, and it doesn't seem like it, Monk and I were talking about that today. But uh, it is an interesting prophet, and really, I mean, each time it seems like we say this, that Amos uh, was like a prophet unlike each other, uh, unlike another one, because once again, there is something different. There's something different about all of them. But as we're going to see, that he did not claim to be a prophet, nor did he claim to be the son of a prophet. <laughs> this man was a man that was just obedient to do what the Lord asked him to do. And, and that's the type of man that he was. And something else is interesting about the prophecies of Amos is that he actually prophesied during a time of national peace and optimism. Everything was looking good, as we're going to see here in just a little bit. And so for him to come and prophesy to these people during a time of smooth sailing, this kind of uh, this was different, and it caught the people off guard, as we're going to see. Let's open up the word of prayer at this time, okay? Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the time you've given us to study your word, to break it down, Father, as we see here on a Wednesday night just... Just going through your word. And Father, I pray that we leave here tonight knowing a little bit more than we came in, Lord. And so, Father, I pray that you'll use the book of Amos tonight to speak to our hearts and see how it relates to us. And so, Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you how it does apply. And so, Lord, I just pray that you continue to encourage hearts here tonight. Encourage the saints. Father, use this time. Let us continue to walk in you properly and do what you've asked us to do. Forgive us for we fail you, Lord. God, we love you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. On the outside looking in, things look good in Israel during this time. It really did. Things looked good. Things looked to be on the up and up. Business was booming and all was well physically, but spiritually, there was something going on in, in the state of Israel, okay, in the nation of Israel. It really was. It was a different story. And this book really speaks to us on the same level because so many times... When things are going well, what do we do? We tend to forget God. And we tend to go our own way and do the things that we want to do. And that's what happens so many times. But they were at the point to where their religious motions had replaced true worship in a sense that had created a false sense of security to where they thought that they were okay. They thought that everything they were doing were okay. And what that led to then was callousness to the Lord. It led to callousness. And, and like I said, they were just going through the motions. So in comes our prophet Amos. And listen, he was a farmer, a sheep herder, called by God to deliver the news. What an interesting man that we're going to see. And, and when you look at the life of Amos, it's almost like he was born for this. And, and we, know, we know that's the case, and God knows our life. He knows us and has a plan for us, even you know, as he forms us in the mother's womb, right? We know that, and, and this is the case. But you know what his name meant? His name was actually the Hebrew, comes from the Hebrew root word amas, A-M-A-S, okay? And the name actually means to carry a burden or to be a burden bearer. 
Think about this. To be a burden bearer. Man, that's something you'd want your name to mean, wouldn't it? Right? <laughs> but to be a burden bearer. And so this is what really what he does. And we're, as we're going to see, Amos definitely lives up to his name and the meaning of his name by giving and declaring judgment to a rebellious Israel. They didn't even know they were being rebellious at this time. Like I said, they, they thought that everything was going good. And as we look at the time frame here, they thought everything was going great. But in he comes. Now, J. Vernon McGee, in his commentary, I, I love what he says about Amos right here. This is how he titles him. He says this, Amos is a country preacher who came to town. I like that. A country preacher who came to town. And, and I agree with him on this. And Amos was born, and here's something else interesting. Amos was actually born down in Judah. Okay, He's born in the south, in the southern kingdom. But he goes up and prophesies in the northern kingdom, okay? So he moves up north to, to share this prophecy. And, and really, it was unusual to have a man to come from, from the country with a message of judgment against not just Israel, but also, as we're going to see, all the surrounding nations. Amos has, once again, that, that message not just for Israel, but for all surrounding nations. And we see in verse 1 really where he comes from. We see right here that he's a herdsman from Tekoa. Listen to it. Let's start with verse 1. The words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Okay? Let's stop right there for a moment. Okay? So we see this is the case. Now, Tekoa was Amos's birthplace. Okay? It's his hometown. Now, let's Six miles south of Jerusalem, there's a very familiar town called Bethlehem. We know that town, right? We've heard of that town. Uh, that, that's, that's, we know that. But we know about that place. But there's another place, another six miles southeast of Bethlehem called Tekoa. Now, let me tell you what's incredible about the town Tekoa. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> there is nothing in this town. It is straight wilderness. There is nothing in this town. There's nothing in this place. The only claim to fame that this place has is that this is the place where a prophetess, if you remember, came to David in 2 Samuel chapter 14 and gave him a message. Okay, This is where David was actually one of the places he was hiding out when he was running away from King Saul. Okay, So that's the only thing that this town is known for. And David was familiar with this, like I said, because that was where he hid out. But Tekoa is nothing but desert wilderness that actually leads up to the edge of the Dead Sea. Okay, so that's where this town is. There's nothing there, and there never has been anything there. Okay, there's nothing in this town, but that's where Amos is from. But back to Amos, we learn actually most about him personally in chapter 7. We're coming back to chapter 1, but y'all flip over to chapter 7 with me. Right here in chapter 7, this is the verse, start with verse 10. It says this. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from their own land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah. There eat bread and there prophesy. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is the royal residence. Now, we will get into that, but I want to read that to you right now. But we will get into the meaning of that here in just a moment. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and the tender of sycamore fruit. Then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. So we see that he was a herdsman, and he was a gatherer of sycamore fruit. Okay? Little bitty, which is about the size of figs, okay? So it was a little bitty fruit. So we see that Amos was basically I'll tell you, a migrant worker, just like sheep, uh, just like shepherds, that uh, they would go from town to town, but that's what he did, and he picked fruit. He was truly a farmer. He was a country bumpkin. But as we're going to see, he ends up being one of God's greatest men. And the message that he brings right here, but basically... The high priest, Amaziah, right here, told him that he was not welcome there to share the kind of message that he was sharing. So in the day of prosperity, Amos comes into town and preaches judgment. In a time of prosperity, here he comes. Friends, let me just say this. I believe that the judgment of God awaits nations that live in luxury but struggles with immorality. 
I do. I believe that. And we're one of them. So let's get into our outline tonight. And I want us to look at this and see this and see how it relates to us, okay? So if you got your outline, I want you to see this. Let's go through this right here, okay? So number one, number one, let's look at the fact, get into our outline. First of all, we see Amos' calling and judgment against many nations. And we see this in chapters one and two. We really do. We see this right here. We immediately see that, once again, he was among the, the sheep breeders, and we immediately know when this time is. Look at verse one again. He says this, the words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So he tells us of the time period of when this is. We see this. By the way, this is Jeroboam the second, by the way. This is the time. I know it says Jeroboam there, the son of Joash, but actually it's Jeroboam the second, okay? It was the grandson of Jeroboam, okay? That's, that's during this time period. And this earthquake, though, we know the time period that it is because it's mentioned by Zechariah, the prophet, the prophet okay? So we know when this is, and, and it took place during the reign of Uzziah. So right here, friends, we know about the time frame that Amos is prophesying because actually he was a contemporary with Hosea then. So if he's prophesying during the time of Uzziah, guess what? So did Hosea. So Hosea and Amos may have known each other. Okay, that they may have known each other and heard about the prophecies of one another during that time. So if you don't write that down, that's good. But so what we see right here is that Amos was one of the first prophets in which we learned about Joel a few weeks ago. Okay, but Amos was along with Hosea. Okay, so we know that. But it's interesting to see something that, that I think is pretty cool. Amos gives an entire worldview here. Now, what I mean by that is he speaks first to the nations which is surrounding the nation of Israel. And then he speaks directly to uh, Israel. So in other words, he speaks, first of all, to the great world nations of that day. He starts off by talking to the surrounding countries when all other prophets already st always start with Israel, then talk about the judgment of the other nations. Amos doesn't do that. He starts backwards, okay? He starts otherwise. He starts talking about the entire world first, the world that they knew at that time, all the surrounding nations and then Israel. So Amos goes in reverse in that method. But he spoke first of God's judgment to the nations around Israel, and then he speaks of Israel's judgment. But from verse 3 all the way to chapter 2, verse 3, Amos speaks to the surrounding nations. Now, when it says something, it's, it's going to sound repetitive. Every time that he talks to a different nation, I want you to see this. He says something very interesting. He says, for three transgressions and for four. Let me explain to you what that means. To all these nations, Amos is not attempting to give us a list of their transgressions or anything like that. He could have said, not for three or for four or for five, but for many. In other words, what Amos is saying is this, that their cup of iniquity was full. In other words, God's had it with all of you. That's what he's saying. He's had it with all of you. Yet there's been multiple, multiple, multiple iniquities that you've transgressed against God, and God has had it with all of you. And, and so that's what he does, and, and he goes and he starts talking to them, and, and he's letting them know that, in other words, that this is the case, and nothing could now hold back the judgment of God that is about to come upon them. And he's letting them know this. Very quickly, let's see what their judgment was. Very quickly. We're not going to read all of it, but I, I want you to see what it is. When you look in chapter 1, verse 3 through 5, we see judgment against Damascus, okay? We see judgment against their, what What for? For their cruelty. They were, they, were, they were absolutely cruel. Matter of fact, listen to what it says right here. It says this, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because they have threshed Gilead with implements of iron, but I will send fire into the house of Hazel, which shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. I will also break the gate bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitant from the valley of Eben. And the one who holds the scepter from Beth Eden, the people of Syria, shall go captive to, uh, to Kir, says the Lord. Stop right there. So we see that, once again, for their cruelty. And then next, in, in verse 6 through 8, we see judgment against Gaza for making slaves. That's what we see right there. Then in verses 9 through 10, Tyre, he cast judgment against them. Why? What do they do? They broke a treaty. He's upset about them for breaking a treaty. Then we see in verse 11 through 12, Edom. They had a very revengeful spirit about them, okay? And then in verses 13 through 15, 
we see Amon for violent pride. So listen to this one. Verse 13 says this. says, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the people of Amon and for four, listen to this, I will not turn away its punishment, listen to this one, because they have ripped open the women with child in Gilead, that they might enlarge their territory. But I will kindle a fire on the wall of Rabbah, and it shall devour its palaces amid shouting in the day of battle and a tempest in the day of the whirlwind. The king shall go into captivity, he and his princes together, says the Lord. Violent crimes. They're ripping open pregnant women. Killing the babies, okay? Doing things like that, okay? Then we see uh, he casts judgment against Moab for injustice in chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. But then finally he gets to Judah. And he gets to Israel. He gets to his people here. And we see judgment against Judah for basically def just absolutely despising the law. Now this is what is interesting. God's people despising the law. Listen to chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. It says this. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments. Their lies lead them astray, lies which their fathers followed. But I will send a fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. So we see right here that they just despised the law of the Lord. But guess what? They were still worshiping the Lord, going through the motions of worshiping the Lord. Okay? But yet they despised the law. In other words, what I'm trying to say is this. They went through the motions of going to the temple. They made the sacrifices that they need to. But don't tell me how to live. Does that sound familiar to a day and age? Yes. Possibly. Then we see the judgment against Israel for immorality and for blasphemy. Listen to verse 6 and 7. Verse 6 and 7 says this. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four... I will not turn away its punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. They pant after the dust of the earth, which is on the head of the poor, and pervert the way of the humble. A man and his father go into the same girl to defy my holy name. They lie down by every altar on clothes taken in pledge and drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. Perversion. Immorality. That's what we see them doing. But we also see how they failed to recognize the Lord. And listen, they didn't want to hear what the Lord had to say. Listen to verse 11. Verse 11 says this. I raised up some of your sons as prophets and some of your young men as Nazarites. Is it not so, O you children of Israel, says the Lord? Listen to this. But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets, saying, Do not prophesy. Once again, does this sound familiar? Let me explain to you what's taking place right here. They took the blessings of God. They took them. They wanted the blessings of God, but didn't give him recognition. And plus, they didn't even want to know what God had to say. Oh, we want the blessing, but you know what? We don't want to hear from your prophets, God. We want the, ble we want the good things of God, but don't tell me how to run my life, God. Oh, sure, I, I, I want it all, all to come in, but... but Oh, how to live for you? No, 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 no. I, I'm going to do what I want to do. There they were. One of the blessings, but not the rules of God. That they didn't want that. Didn't want the law of God. Once again, this does sound very familiar. And so because of that, friends, we see number two in our outline. Number two, we see judgments against Israel. Chapters three through six. And wow. Once again, I remind you, Amos is from the south. Okay? He's from the south. Well, we get a little stubborn from the south sometimes, don't we? He's from the south. He's a southerner. But he's prophesying in the northern kingdom. But the judgment is for both. How do you know, Brother Callum? Listen to verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. It says this. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel. Listen to this. Against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt. You see, what was happening right here, he's speaking to the whole family of Israel of Israel, which the Lord God had brought out of Egypt. So in the Lord's eyes, listen, they were not northern kingdom, southern kingdom. They were not two kingdoms. They were one people. And in God's eyes right here, the twelve tribes were one family before him. And listen to verse 2. Listen to what it says right here in verse 2. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. What is Amos saying right here? This is, this is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. 
And what I mean by this is Amos did not beat around the bush. He didn't mince words. He comes right out and says that God's going to punish you for your iniquities. It's going to happen. Okay? He knows you. He knows you above all the people of the earth. That's what it says right there, right? So he knows them personally. He has that relationship with them. But if you're not going to do what I'm saying, punishment is coming. And that's what happened. It's too bad the politicians and the priests, they wouldn't listen to him. If they had, they could, it could have been a different story for Israel. They didn't listen. And I love chapter 3, verse 7. Listen to what he says right here. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, prophets. Let me say that again. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. You know what this tells me, friends? Listen. The Lord always gives a warning. Do you hear me? The Lord always gives a warning. No one is without excuse. Or no one can sit back and say, we didn't know. No one can say that. God right here in his grace and his mercy, if he wanted to, he could have just sat back and said, you're not going to listen to me? Fine. See, I'm done with you. Wipe you off the face of the earth. But every time, what, what do we see every time the Israelites turn away from God? What does he do? He sends someone to them. He gives them a warning every single time. And, and, and that's what we see right here. He, he, he gives a warning. But he goes on and, and he talks about how he will affect their riches throughout the rest of the chapter. They think they're living large. They, they think they're, they're above reproach. They, they think that nothing can touch them. When you read the rest of the chapter... But God talks about how he's going to take away their palaces. Matter of fact, he even goes on later on and says how he's going to take away their summer homes and their winter homes. And he's going to take, I mean, they, they have the good, they're living it up right now. Like I told you, they're, they're in a peace time. They're, they're, they're being blessed right now. They think by God and, and nothing can hurt them. And so they're just going through the motions. But then, friends, we get to chapter 4. I want you to listen to chapter 4, verse 1. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring wine, let us drink. Um, let me just say this. Don't get mad at me if I let this be a Mother's Day message next year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking, ladies. I'm just joking. But who is he speaking to? The women. Cows of Bashan. Brave man, Amos. Brave man. Okay? <laughs> wow. But listen to me. I was joking about the Mother's Day message, ladies. Okay? Forgive me for that. All right? Forgive me. I'm just joking. But listen. What he is saying right here is he is letting them know something interesting. You see, listen. When you look at this, who is Amos addressing? Bashan was a territory that was on the east of the Jordan River. It was the richy area of Israel. In other words, listen to me, y'all. This was the Beverly Hills of Israel, okay? Every section has a town, you know, that, that is kind of like this is the richer area. This is the poorer area. Bashan was definitely the richer area. It overlooked the Jordan River, okay? This was the richy area. He's speaking to the women who were living in luxury. These are the women that were well-fed, they were well-dressed, well-groomed, and had control of their husbands. These are men that were given in to their women. And the ladies controlled the house. And they liked to live in wealth. And they liked all the goods of the world. And, and, this is, and how they got it, though, they were able to enjoy this wealth because the Bible says right here that the poor were oppressed. Notice what it says. Who oppresses the poor, who crushes the needy. Maybe their husbands were the politicians. Just being honest with you. They got money from the poor. They got money from the needy to feed their own wealth, their own desires. And they were the ones sitting back calling the shots. Their wives were. And because of this, let's just be honest. God's upset. He's upset at how the poor is being treated. He's upset at how the needy is being treated. But in the end, for these women, listen to what the Lord says in verse 2 and 3. They'll, they're going to be dragged away with fish hooks if they don't repent. Listen to this. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness, behold, the day shall come upon you when he will take you away with fish hooks 
and your posterity with fish hooks. You will go out through broken walls, each one straight ahead of her, and you will be cast into Harmon, says the Lord. It's talking about when the city is going to be ravaged. The wall is going to be broken down. We've already seen it in the past. We've seen this. I remind you, this is Amos, one of the earlier own prophets. But he's letting them know that when this happens, ladies, you're living in luxury right now. You're going to be dragged from those richy homes with fish hooks in your mouth. Hmm. That'll put a smile on the face, won't it? Drag them out through the broken down walls. He's letting them know that it's going to come back to them. It's going to come upon them. And God gave them, once again, when, when you look at this, you see this, and you look at the rest of chapter 4. God gave them warnings and small judgments to get them to repent. He would give them little small judgments here and there. And guess what? They were not seeing the signs. You know, I, I sit back and, and I ask you later on to go back and read chapter 4. But as I, I read the, the second part of chapter 4, it, it, it hit me to the fact that I, I wonder how many small judgments are upon America right now and we're not seeing the signs. We're not seeing it. Or maybe we are and we're just not doing anything about it. We're talking about it among our group. Talk about it maybe among other believers, but we're not warning the world about it. We're not warning America about it. That's exactly what was taking place right here. And when you look at chapter 5, you look at chapter 6, they're all warnings to the people. And they will know that the judgment is from God if they don't turn. As a matter of fact, one interesting one is chapter 6, verse 10. This one it says right here. Verse 10. And when a relative of the dead with one who will burn the bodies picks up the bodies to take them out of the house, he will say to one inside the house... Are there any more with you? Then, one, then someone will say, none. And he will say, hold your tongue, for we dare not mention the name of the Lord. What? What he's saying right here is this, y'all. The warning of God has come, and they know the judgment has come from God. But yet they're still not willing to repent. They're saying, we're, we're, not even still, we're not going to mention the name of the Lord. God's brought this upon us. So we're not going to mention it. Wow. You know, there's a part of me that, that sits back and thinks, Lord, what does it take to turn people over? What's it going to take? You know as well as I do, there are sometimes there are people that they hit that bottom of the barrel, and you're like, surely they're going to come up from that, right? And they still don't. And you're like, well, where's your discernment? What, you know, what, where's the what is it going to take? I mean, these are people that are bringing bodies out to be burned. They're bringing the bodies out, and they're like, is there any more in the house? No. Well, shh, we don't mention the name of the Lord here. And they knew it came from God. They knew the judgment came from God, but still, shh, we're not talking about it. That's sad. But yeah, I dare say every one of us knows individuals like that. They still don't return. And you sit back and wonder, when, when will they ever learn? <laughs> but these are warnings to the people. And then because of that, thirdly, we see in our outline, because of Amos being open with them, we see Amos is attacked personally in chapter 7. We see a personal attack. Now, chapter 7, it's pretty interesting. Chapter 7 begins with, with Amos having visions of the future. And he tells them about these visions. And even though this country bumpkin comes from nowhere, here's what's interesting. He gets, the, he gets the attention of the elites. He gets their attention. And he's in the middle of the synagogue, and he's saying this, and he tells them about the vision of locusts that he has. It's going to come to the land. It's going to ravage the land in verses 1 through 3. Then he tells them the vision of the fire that he has. It's going to come to the land and ravage the land in verses 4 through 6. But the interesting vision is the plumb line that he has. Look at verse 7. Verse 7 says this. Thus he showed me, behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. And the Lord said, behold, I'm setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate and the sanctuary of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise with a sword against the house of Jeroboam. Let me explain to you what's happening right here. The plumb line is a measuring line. That's what it is. 
It's, a, it's the measuring line. And every time that you see plumb line used in Scripture, it's used four different times. But every time it's used, it means that God has had enough and he's ready to judge. It's kind of like the old saying goes, like, I've drawn the line in the sand. Don't cross this line. Well, he's measured their iniquity, and it's enough. It's enough. Well, how much is enough? That's up to God. But he's got the plumb line right there, and he's had enough. And it means that he's had enough, and he's getting ready to judge. So he's checking up to see how well they're measuring up to his requirements, and judgment's coming. Judgment is coming. And the priest Amaziah doesn't like it. The high priest Amaziah doesn't like what he's heard, so he goes to the king. Look at the next part right here. He goes to the king and tells him what Amos says, and then he goes to Amos himself. And as we see right here, Amos, uh, Amaziah basically tells Amos that he needs to leave, and he wasn't welcome there to speak such evil things. Keep going. Look at what it says here in verse, verse 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from their own land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee the land of Judah. There eat bread, and there prophesy. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is the royal residence. We see this right here. This is what is so interesting. He tells him he's not welcome here. You know, you know, I know who Amaziah is. Are you ready for this? If you want to write this down, this is who Amaziah is. Amaziah is a hired preacher that said what wanted to be said and told the king what the king wanted to hear. And what's interesting is this. The truth was too hard for them to hear it. What? Look at what Amaziah says right there. Look, look on down here a little bit further. Uh, when he says... In verse 10. Yeah. Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. He says it right here. The land is not able to bear all his words. Let me ask you this question. Once again, sound familiar. What do you mean, Brother Colin? Well, best example I can think of is a very well-known pastor in Texas was recently asked the question why he never preached on sin. Here was his response. Are you ready for this? Here was his response. You know, I'm just going to say it. We're going to call out the heretics. It was Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen said this. Here's what he said. I try to be a positive preacher. There's enough pushing people down in life already, he added. When they come to my church or our meetings, I want them to be lifted up. I want them to know that God's good and that they can move forward. They can break in addiction. They can, can, they can become who God has created them to be. That's why I never mention sin. Who are they? In other words, Joel Osteen himself has said, the land is not able to bear the words of the Lord. In other words, the, the people don't want to hear this. The people can't hear. They can't take this truth. That's who Amaziah is. That's the Amaziah of the day. So, so I, I want you to understand this. Amos looks right at him. And Amos says this. Remember this. Chapter 7, verse 14 through 17 says this. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet. Nor was I a son of a prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. Listen to this. Then the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel, and do not spout against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Your wife shall be a harlot in the city. Your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword. Your land shall be divided by survey line. You shall die in a defiled, defiled land, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from his own land. Mic drop. In other words, Amos looks right back at him and says, Hey, listen, man, I didn't ask to deliver this message. Amaziah, I was minding my own business herding sheep. 
I was gathering sycamore fruit. I was doing this and picking fruit, but you know what? God called me to do this. It's not that I, I didn't want to do this. God called me to do this. And since you're telling me to stop, the Lord says all this stuff is going to happen to you. And think about what is about to happen to Amaziah. Look at that again. Look at this. He says, your wife shall be a harlot in the city. A holy priest, his wife's about to become a harlot in the city. Keep going. Your sons and your daughters will fall by the sword. They're going to be killed. Keep going. Your land shall be divided by survey line. In other words, they're going to divvy up his land of the priest of Amaziah. Keep going. You shall die in a defiled land. That's the icing on the cake right there. What? He's not going to get to die in Israel. He will die in a defiled land. And then Israel shall surely be led away captive from his own land. There it is. Because you're trying to tell me to stop, it's going to come upon your own head, Amaziah. Wow. That was definitely something Amaziah didn't want to hear. Right? Definitely some things right there. He says, this is going to happen to you. And then because of that, we see number four. The people are compared to ripe fruit in chapter 8. This right here is the fourth vision that Amos has. The fourth vision that he has. First of all, uh, he compares them right here to ripe fruit, but he compares to them a basket of fruit. Now, let me explain to you what this means. They have been harvested. That's what it means. A basket of fruit means that it's been picked, Right? It's been rock. It's been picked. But let me ask you this. Let's just imagine you go to E.W. James, you go to Walmart, okay, and you buy, you buy some bananas. Now, if you're like the man household, you buy bananas and you forget about them. I always say, why are we buying bananas? Right? Because we may eat one of them. The kids may eat one. And then what ends up happening after a few days? Start turning brown, specialty spots, right? And then all of a sudden, before you know it, it's straight mush. Okay? It is straight brown all the way through, and they've rotted. Okay? At that point in time, they're done. Right? They're done. It's over. And so this basket of fruit, ripe fruit, represents the harvest. They've been picked. But it's also saying this, that harvest time has passed. It's done. They're picked. They're in a basket. It's over. And it speaks of the end of the harvest. That ripe fruit, when left sitting, listen, will ruin it. That's what God is saying about Israel here. It's been picked. It was right. But now it's about to ruin. That's what God is telling through Amos. Look at verse 2. Chapter 8, verse 2 says this. Actually, go back to verse 1. Thus the Lord God showed me, behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what do you see? So I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. Y'all, that is a sad picture for the people of that day. I will not pass by them anymore. And you know what happens? Their empty praises that they had turns to wailing. Listen to verse 3. Verse 3 says this, And the songs of the temple shall be wailing in that day, says the Lord God. Many dead bodies everywhere they shall be thrown out in silence. Wow. What a passage, guys. But the worst part of it all, listen to me, is not just a physical judgment. It's a spiritual judgment. Look down at verse 11 and 12. Verse 11 and 12 says this. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. Wow. That is the worst judgment of all right here. But then finally, we get into number five. We see the destruction of Israel in chapter nine. The destruction of Israel. We see here finally that they learn that there is no more escaping the judgment of God. The time has come. Listen to chapter 9, verse 2 through 4. Listen to what it says. Though they dig into hell, from there my hand shall take them. Though they climb up to heaven, 
from there I will bring them down. And though they hide themselves on top of Carmel, from there I will search and take them. Though they hide, though they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, from there I will command the serpent and it shall bite them. Though they go into captivity before their enemies, from there I will command the sword and it shall slay them. I will set my eyes on them for harm and not for good. Wow. In other words, no matter where you go, you can't outrun me. <laughs> no matter where you go, I see it all. You cannot escape God. Let that be a lesson to all of us, friends. You cannot escape God. You can't do it. And that's what we see right here. But I love how Amos even reminds the people of the omnipotence of God. Listen to what he says in verse, uh, verse 6. Verse 6 says this. He who builds his layers in the sky and has founded his strata in the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them on the face of the earth, the Lord is his name. In other words, he's all powerful. He's the one that can do whatever he wants to do. So Amos is letting them know, hey, God just told you, if you try to even go down to hell, he's going to pull you up out of it, and he's going to punish you there, okay? If you try to climb up to heaven, he's going to drag you back down, he's going to punish you. If you try to hide in the depths of the ocean, he's going to punish you. By the way, who's the one that made all this? This is what Amos is saying. Who's the one that poured the water in the ocean? Who's the one that did all these things? The Lord is his name. That's what he says. The Lord is his name. He reminds them of this. But y'all... <laughs> In the gracious, mercy, loving God that we have. Listen, God also, as he always does, gives them hope. Listen to verse 8. Verse 8 says this. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful kingdom. And I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Listen to this. Yet, I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. In other words, I'm going to leave a remnant. I'm going to leave a remnant. Why? Because it goes back to Genesis. He made a promise. Do you remember that? He made a promise. And so he's saying, listen, I'm not going to destroy all of you. I'm going to leave a remnant. That's being a gracious God. That's a loving God. And that's what he says right here. Now look down in verse 11 and 12. Verse 11 and 12 says this. On that day... I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as of the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. Stop right here. James actually quotes this passage in the book of Acts, chapter 15. If you want to write this down, Acts 15, verse 13 through 18. Go back and look at it later on. Because it's interesting how James uses this passage. James himself, in the book of Acts, talks about this. He is warning the brethren to not trouble those from among the Gentiles that are turning to God. Matter of fact, we see this as you go down. Friends, listen, listen to this right here. Keep going. Verse 12, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does this thing. Listen. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the, and the treader of grapes him who sows seed. The mountain shall drip with sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with it. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I've given them, says the Lord your God. Listen, y'all know when this is? We're living in it, baby. It's right now. 1948, the first time any time like this has ever happened in history, a country that was completely dead came back to life. We know that. According to the promise of God right here, they're never going to lose that land again. It's not going to happen. So of all the threats and everything else that you hear and all the things that's going on about it splitting up again, it's not going to happen. Jesus is going to come on the scene. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. He's made a promise, and we see this right here. And guess what's happening right now? Y'all, just, just get on and look at how Israel is blessed. Look online right now. They're a blessed country right now. Matter of fact, we've talked this before. They've recently found oil in Israel. We know that, okay? Things are taking place in Israel. They're being blessed left and right. 
And we know that in the end times, the countries are going to come against them. We know that. Guess what's happening? Countries are coming against them. We know this. But in other words, listen, verse 13 through 15 talks about how in the last days the nation of Israel will be blessed again. And they are. They are. And once again, according to verse 15, they're not going to lose it again. They're not going to lose it again. So how do we apply this book, Brother Callum? We ask this question every week. Listen to me, friends. We need to see the signs. We need to boldly speak the truth. We need to let people know this and let the world know that God is about to say enough. That's what we need to let the world know. That God is about to say enough. Church, it is our job to call sin, sin, and understand and let the people know that God is going to deal with it. When it looks like they're getting by with it, God's about to deal with it. God's going to deal with it. But in the end, he always takes care of his own, doesn't he? He always takes care of his own. Memory verse for next week. Amos chapter 3, verse 7. And it simply says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. That's short. You got it, Miss Fang. That's a short one. Amos 3. <laughs> She's already forgotten it. Amos 3, 7. No, you got it, man. You got it. 3, 4. 3, 7. 3, 7. <laughs> Jerry, write it down for her. You got it? Okay, very good. She's got it. She's got it. All right, here we go. Questions for the night. <laughs> That's all right, right Mr. Marty. Can have it. I'm looking at chapter 7, verses 3 and verse 6. Okay. The Lord relents, it mentions. Uh, yes. A couple times there. When the Lord changes his mind, is, that, is this really what he was planning to do all along? Yes. Because I remind you, once again, it's not, God is never caught off guard. Right. We've talked about this before. But also, it's kind of like a warning to your child. If you don't stop, spanking's coming. Right? You know, top deal, it's, it's a great warning. But he knew he would relent. He knew the outcome. But he did it that one time, right there. He gave him another chance. Well, the Bible mentions, you know, sometimes God repents. But repentance is not the same for God. It's not the same. No, sir. Uh-uh. But is relent and repent the same thing? No, sir. Uh-uh. No. Relent, once again, is you hold back. Repentance is a change of direction. So like if you repent from your sin, you're changing from what you're doing, and you're going a different route. Relenting is holding back. Yeah. Go ahead. Chapter eight, verse eleven through twelve, that you mentioned about uh, Israel's judgment includes God's absence. Yes, sir. Just a commentary I mentioned he was serving his people spiritually. I can't think of any more anything more intolerable than that. Yes, sir. I agree with you. I think it'd be literally hell. It would be. Well, you got to think, if God's not in the land, and if God's not speaking to you, and if God's not answering you, then, man, that, that is a literal hell. It is. Yes, sir. Maybe I've got another one. Uh, yes, sir. It seems Amos, did Amos have a burning in his heart as Jeremiah did to get God's word out? Oh, I'm sure, absolutely. I mean, he was a sheep herder and picking sycamore fruit. You know, I, I'm sure he was, uh, uh, you know, happy doing his thing, and, and more than likely, he was a loner. Just being honest with you, you know, most shepherds were. They were isolated and, and, you know, they were considered outcast. And so, once again, here he was. I'm sure he was alone or happy doing his own thing. And now to stand in the midst of the temple and speak speak to the king and speak to the, the chief priest, I'm sure that was out of his comfort zone. Absolutely. But as he told Amaziah, but God's called me to do this. You know. That was the only credential that uh, Amos really had. Was God called him. That's it. Yes, sir. And you know, I'll say this, uh, y'all know I'm a Spurgeon fan. Spurgeon, actually, he, uh, uh, not many of you know this, but um, they tried to ordain Spurgeon. And Spurgeon did not want to be ordained. He said, I'm called by God. I don't need man's hands laid upon me to tell me what I can and can't do. That's exactly what C.H. Spurgeon said. He said, I'm called by God. So he refused ordination. Spurgeon did. Interesting. A little history there for you. Yes, sir. It's like a fig. It's, what it, it's off a sycamore tree. And when I, I asked the same question, when I looked up the commentary, that's what it said. It said it's, it's like a fig. I guess you eat it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say to that? 
<laughs> y'all have sycamore trees as it produce fruit? Yeah, y'all know it? That's probably what it is. And they may have mushed it up or something. I don't know. Try that, Paris, and let me know how it goes for you, okay? Okay. <laughs> so it's not fake juice. No, no, it's not. That's not right. Very good. All right, any more? Very good. Any more questions tonight? No? Okay. No questions, but I've got an announcement to make. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Fang. All right. I had the, I had the word sent out that we would be meeting at the uh, LT for uh, Friday. But they got it all tore up, I heard. So <laughs> we're going to have to come here to the, to the fellowship hall. So if there's somebody that you know of that's not here tonight, tell them we're going to put a sign up there saying come back to this church. But just in case, it would be good for them to know if you know somebody, okay? So I'll see y'all Friday. That's it. Okay. All right. They are. They're remodeling the LC for college house, so it's, it's going to look nice. So, but yeah, right now they've got it more up. So. 1130, yes, 1130. Chicken, we'll have chicken. All right. It's the Baptist bird. <laughs> All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, I want to give you some updates 